I think one of them were not too sure about that picture with the Easter Bunny. <laughs> I know some of you may wonder about the Easter Bunny, and in case you don't know, the Easter Bunny is a Christian <laughs> and is a member of Calvary Assembly, so that's right, we take all comers. We're in the Gospel of John, and we are in chapter 14, and um, the uh, scripture is on the screen as well as in the notes that you received on the way in. Thomas said to Jesus, Lord... We do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. I think uh, there's lots of times in our lives when we have like to carry around pictures. Back in the old days, we carried them in our wallets and in our purses, but now we carry them on our smart devices. And they capture moments when we either want to remember something or we want to share that memory with someone else. Pictures are very important in our culture. In fact, if a famous person winds up in an unexpected place with an unexpected person, that will usually make the news, and a lot of people will be very interested in that. Sometimes when you're looking at an old picture, you actually notice something that you'd never noticed before, or maybe you just remember something that you'd forgotten. And there are moments in our lives when we wish we had that camera with us and we could capture a moment because of how precious or personal it was. Maybe there's a person in your life you wish you had a picture of. Well, there's other kinds of pictures besides the one we carry around in albums or in our smart devices. And that's the pictures that are stored in our hearts and in our minds, our imaginations. Wouldn't it be cool if we had an actual picture of God? There was a teacher who was doing an art class for children in an elementary school and so she had told them to draw whatever picture she, they wanted. And there was a little girl in the back row who was just drawing furiously. And she went back to see what she was drawing. And she said, what are you drawing? She says, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, you can't draw a picture of God. Nobody knows what he looks like. And the little girl said, they will in a minute. <laughs> she had that part figured out. So what do you think God is like? A lot of people think that God is just mostly angry, especially in the Old Testament, that he was ornery and frustrated, and finally he either aged out or someone finally got him his cup of coffee in the New Testament, and now he's just a little bit nicer. Jesus was explaining to his friends and to his followers that he was going to be betrayed, and in fact, he was not going to survive this experience. It was going to cost him his life. And he told them that he was going to return to his heavenly Father and that he was going to prepare a place for them. That caused a fair amount of confusion and concern with his closest followers. They began to ask questions because they weren't sure they knew the way to get to the Father's house, and they didn't think they knew that much about the Father. That's because they had a picture of God already in their hearts and in their minds. This is the first point I want you to see today, and that is how you see God will determine how you live. How you see God will determine how you live. Our picture of God can be formed by lots of things. Some of us see God as an extension of our parents. Maybe that's a good deal and maybe it's not such a good deal for you. Some of us see God as an extension of church representatives or leadership. And for some of you, maybe you've had some really good experiences with church leadership and maybe for others of you, it's been a very painful one. Some of us, our picture of God comes from the culture around us, which by and large is not very positive. Uh, they ask what they perceive to be complicated questions. And uh, so they often challenge at least the goodness of God, if not the greatness of God. 
and often come to the conclusion that he doesn't exist at all. Um, how you see God impacts your everyday life. If you see God as kind of an impersonal force that you just kind of tap into, well, your faith is going to be a pretty emotionless faith, and you're going to be pretty ambiguous about your relationship with God in general. If you see God as a tyrant who's looking for reasons to punish. I, I knew a dad who used to walk in the house every day after work and look at his kids and say, what have you done that I can spank you for today? Uh, how would you like to be greeted like that every day? And... Uh, uh, if you have a view of God like that, then you're likely going to be very uncomfortable anything around spirituality, and joy is going to be something that is non-existent. Or maybe you see God as the ultimate spy, the diligent recorder of every mistake and misdeed that you commit. And if you see God like that, you're never going to be comfortable around him or in acknowledging any of your faults and failures. You just see that he's adding it to the ever-growing list of your imperfections. Some people see God as kind of a reward card, just this uh, heavenly genie that bestows wishes. But if, if you see God that way, you're going to get disillusioned pretty quickly because uh, we don't get everything we want in this world. How many already figured that part out? And those of you who didn't raise your hand, I've got bad news for you today. Uh, I know you thought you were coming for good news, but the bad news is, uh, well, didn't somebody sing it? You can't always get what you want. You didn't know we quoted those people here, did you? <laughs> so the good news is, the picture you have of God can actually be retaken. The image that you have of God can be reformed. And that's why this passage we look at is so incredibly powerful. It's wise and helpful for us to know we don't know all there is to know about God. There's great mystery in him. And it's not because he's hiding from us. It's because we don't know anybody else like him. You've never met anybody like God. He's just different in every capacity you care to measure. If you think you figured God out, well, you're mistaken. I have to be the first one to admit that religious environments and religious leaders often feel more comfortable if there's less mystery. Like we can reduce the supernatural and the spiritual to a list of doctrinal statements so that we can control it and maybe God in the process. We often want a tame God. We, we want a trained God. We want a God you can control. But just think about that. Do we really want a God that people can control? What kind of hell would be unleashed in our world if people could make God do what they wanted? It's a terrifying thought. So the Christian faith makes an unusual claim. It claims that God actually stepped into human history in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in the passage we read today, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. The Apostle Paul would write to the Colossian church later on, and he would say that Jesus is actually the image of the invisible God. If you want a clearer picture of who God is, you have to study the life of Jesus. The more you know about him, the more you will know about our Heavenly Father. And if you have any idea that looks different than Jesus, any concept of God that looks different than Jesus, it's not because God changed, it's because our view is inaccurate. This is a challenge for us. Scripture insists that God so loved every single person on the face of this planet that he gave his one and only son. Scripture makes this claim, God is love. Not just God has love, but God is love. Our world, how, 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 can, we, how can we get a grip on this? I'm going to ask you to use your imagination today. How many have one? Okay. If the person next to you didn't raise their hand, you'll have to share yours with, their, with them. Okay. Let's imagine that the sun was shining today. I know, hard to imagine, isn't it? It actually is shining. We just can't see it. But the sun actually is always shining. The sun can't do anything else. And there's nothing you can do to stop the sun from shining. You can allow the sun to warm you and illuminate your space, or you can hide from the sun and, and uh, uh, live in the dark. But no matter what you do, you can't keep the sun from shining. Nothing you do will change the sun. Well, Jesus demonstrates for us that God is love. And he always loves. 
Nothing ever changes about that. We can open our lives to that love and be transformed by it, or we can separate our lives from it and hide from that love, but there's nothing that you can do that will change God from being a loving God. You can't stop him from being loving. So how do we learn to get this better picture, this clearer picture of who God is? And we can look at the words of Jesus. Jesus' words reveal a picture of God. When you look at the teaching of Jesus, he constantly reveals how loving and compassionate God is. Stories like the prodigal son reveal how relentless and some say even reckless the love of God is. Here's a dirty little secret for you. Some believers in God are actually embarrassed by his love because of how much he loves. And then Jesus' works actually reveal a picture of God. When you examine the works of Jesus, you see that there's complete consistency between the things he teaches and what he does. How many people have you met like that? Just look at who Jesus spent time with. Jesus spent time with unpopular public officials. Now, for some of you, that would mean the current president. And for others of you, that would mean the former president. And there are some of us that would be annoyed that Jesus was spending any time with either one of those. And that is because when politics is more important to us than God, we try to control who God spends time with. That's a real challenge in our culture. Jesus spent time with unpopular public officials. He spent time with the terminally ill and brought healing to them. He spent time to the marginalized and the isolated, the people who were kept in isolation. You weren't allowed to touch or speak to them. He spent time with children. Children actually liked to be around Jesus. What does that tell you about who Jesus was? And because he spent time with people who thought that he represented God, they felt accepted by God. See, the works of Jesus give us a picture of God. Jesus' death also reveals a picture of God. Jesus' death takes us deep into the mystery of God. Just look at the description of the eyewitnesses of what happened at the crucifixion. This brutally beaten and tortured body of Christ strips away our assumptions about God's love. There is no explanation for the cross apart from God's love. There's no other reason that God would ever endure that. You can't find another reason. His love is not like our love. Some of us, if somebody even tells us a lie, that relationship is dead to us. Some of us, if someone deeply hurts us or wounds us by their actions or their words, we will surgically cut them out of our lives while we continue to bleed from the wound that they inflicted on us. The cross reveals that God is very, very different. He shows how much he loves us, and he shows how much he values us. And this is another thing about God. He doesn't just imagine our pain. If you've ever been through a really difficult season in your life, and someone comes along and they say, oh, I know what you're going through. If they haven't been through it, they don't know what you're going through. And when they say that to you, you want to come out of your grief and step into anger and grab them (laughs) and throttle them. And if you weren't so exhausted by your grief, you might just do it. Jesus enters our sorrow and pain. He knows our grief. He's experienced it for himself. He's someone who can actually say, I do know what it's like to have your friends betray you. I do know what it's like to have lies told about you. I do know what it's like to be taken advantage of, to be misunderstood, to be beaten, to be scorned, to be mocked. He knows all of those things. And Jesus' resurrection reveals a picture of God too. Jesus shows us that even death and the grave are no match for the love of God. Every wedding that I perform has the same phrase in it. And it is, till death us do part. How many said a phrase like that at some point in your life? Any any married person knows what those phrases look like. Sometimes sometimes couples want to to write their own vows. I never let couples write their own vows. If they want to write something and say it to each other, I will. But they, they write very poetic, lovely things, sentiments. You know, as long as the sun shines and rises, I will love you. As long as the flowers bloom, I will love you. Sometimes the flowers don't bloom. 
What are you going to do with that? What if we're getting one of those wonderful cloudy days like we got? Where, where's your love level right now? No, the, the wedding vows are ironclad contracts. If you've got breath in your body, you're committed. It's love. That's how it is. Yeah. But even in there, we say the love bond ends at death because we don't have anything that goes beyond that. And Jesus says his love doesn't end even there. You want to know what raised Jesus from the dead? It wasn't just some kind of electrical energy, a lightning bolt that flies from heaven. It's a love that you cannot kill inside of him. And it brought him back to life because that is how much he loves us. A lot of people try to focus on the power of God, and they usually think that if God's power is working in your life, then your life is working. But what do you do when suffering enters your world? It can be devastating if that means to you that God's love has waned in some way. One of the most impressive things about Jesus is even after his resurrection, one of the ways you could tell it was him was he still bore the scars of the pain he endured on the cross. It is our world that wants a love that has no pain in it. But that's not real love. That's just infatuation. A love that can go through a cross, that's a real love. And he still has the scars to show for it, and he's not ashamed of that. That's his badge that shows to us how much he truly loves us. Suffering and evil are very real in our world. And loving people are often injured and often don't survive it by the evil that's in our world. That's the harsh reality of our world. But God insists that there's more to our world than just this world. And he insists he gets the last word. Even suffering and death cannot keep his love from transforming and working out his purpose in our lives. In whatever way we experience darkness and death, God is at work to bring life and light. In fact, it's kind of like little mini resurrections. You know, when you're facing incredible despair and you find the courage to step up and face it, that's a mini resurrection. When you're timid and you're afraid to speak up and you find the ability to speak up for yourself, that's a mini resurrection. When a self confident and self reliant person finally reaches out and asks for help, that's a small resurrection right there. When a when forgiveness is offered to a person who's offended you, that's a mini-resurrection. Wherever brokenness gives way to healing and hope, that's a mini-resurrection. And we get glimpses of the incredible resurrection power of God by these smaller resurrections that he does in us day after day after day. Now, some of you are probably starting to get a little uncomfortable. And you're probably saying, hey, does, you're, you, God is nothing but love. Are you saying God never gets angry? I am not saying that. The opposite of love is not anger. The opposite of love is apathy. We don't care what happens. If someone were to hurt someone that you loved, I guarantee one of the emotions you have to contend with is anger. Because you want to stop that pain being imposed in the life of the person that you hold so dear. Well, God does get angry. But God is appropriately angry. He doesn't use his anger like we use our anger. He doesn't use his anger to destroy life. He tries to find a way to redeem life. It makes all the difference in the world. Now, this picture of God is going to do two things. And the first is, it's going to challenge you. Jesus insists that we be challenged by what he has done in our world. And we should examine the evidence for ourselves. Uh, a person who says, well, I, I'll just choose to believe whatever I want to believe. I have discovered that when people believe what they want to believe, they always believe the easiest things to believe. They always believe what feels good. And that's more feeling than actual fact-finding. Uh, that doesn't take a lot of intellectual demand. And so we are confronted in Scripture with some eyewitness accounts. Now, there are some people who say, well, they're not really... You know, th these were written hundreds of years after the life of Jesus and as the legend and the fables grew and then finally somebody wrote it down. Uh, can I just say that anybody who says that has done almost no research. You should just know that. The Gospels and, and the letters of Paul were written within the lifespan of, of when Jesus still walked the earth. Like, Jesus resurrected and those, 
those apostles, they wrote their testimony and they handed out those testimonies and other people read those testimonies during their lifetime. So this isn't something that got drawn up hundreds of years later and generations later. That's not how it actually worked. And they were eyewitness accounts. If you've ever been a juror or on trial, you know that one of the things that happens frequently in a courtroom is as a person is giving a testimony, they will refer to something that someone else saw or heard, and there will always be an immediate objection. You are not allowed to talk about what somebody else saw or heard. You're only allowed to talk about what you saw and heard. Everything else is hearsay. And so the Gospels are the eyewitness accounts of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. If you want to see what the eyewitnesses had to say, then you need to, to, to look at them. But that brings us to a challenge, because God confronts us with two things. Both of them are hard to believe. And the first is, is that Jesus was God's son. He did miracles. He died on a cross, and he rose from the dead. That is hard to believe. I'll be the first to admit it. We don't see that kind of thing in our world. But the second thing is equally hard to believe. And that is that a group of individuals made up a story, distributed the story, and even though they were killed for the things that they were saying, they still hung and clung to their lie because they would not give it up. And not just one of them, but all of them. So which is harder to believe, that Jesus is who he said he was, or there was a conspiracy of liars that even under the torture and pain of, of punishment and of death, they refused to surrender the lie that they had created. That's going to take some intellectual challenge on your part. To say that, well, Jesus was a good man, but uh, not what he said he was, that, that, that's intellectually lazy. We're forced, God wants to challenge us with the eyewitness accounts that we have received. But he also wants to change us. And this is the part that gets a little bit uncomfortable. He wants to change us. See, a lot of us uh, are familiar a little bit with social media. We follow people online. We follow people on Twitter. We follow people on Facebook. We, and then sometimes we unfollow people because they say something we don't like. Uh, some of us don't unfollow them. We just block them so we don't have to see. Uh, following someone and being familiar with the things they post is not the same thing as knowing a person. Uh, let's just see. How many married people do we have in the room? All right. How many have learned something about your spouse since you got married that you didn't know before? Yeah, I'm not taking it any further than that, but <laughs> there it is. See, when you get married, you believe you have enough information that makes this decision reasonable. But there's lots of things you learn after you get married. What happens is, is you begin to share things you never shared with anybody before. And you begin to inform each other about stuff that, that can be annoying. Like All you're going to do is just go buy some milk. But you can't just walk out of the house and say nothing. That's not good. That doesn't work. And so you wind up going and finding your spouse and saying, Well, oh, I'm heading to the store. I'm going to get some milk. And the spouse says, thanks for sharing, and, and, and you go. And lots of people struggle with that. Because what they want is they want the connection without the commitment of all the sharing. That's not really a marriage. That's more a roommate agreement. There's a difference. When you decide to follow Jesus, it's not just becoming informed about things that he has done in his history. And it's not just reading the things that he said. That's not really following Jesus. Following Jesus is when you share everything and talk about everything to him. We have to decide if that's the nature of the relationship we want with God or if we just want to settle for knowing a few facts and feeling like it's benefiting our lives. Let's bow our heads. It's entirely possible that uh, you're here and you've been raised in church all your life and um, it's hard for you to come to places like this because you've either been hurt or your view of God is so harsh and judgmental that it just makes you uncomfortable. It's also entirely possible that 
This is one of the rare occasions in your life, maybe funerals, weddings, and today. You show up in environments like this, and your concept of God is based on things you heard from professors in college or friends in conversations. And what I'd like you to do today, no matter what your background, is to retake the picture of God, to see him for who he really is. Now, lots of us in this room today have already started our spiritual journey. We're not claiming that we know a lot. We're not even claiming that we're perfect. We know better. In fact, that's why we, we turn to Christ, is because we can admit, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. But I believe that Christ will make up the difference between where I am and where God is. So I'm going to ask, if you want to start that journey today, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. The goal is not to embarrass you. I will not do that. But I'm going to start over here at the wall by the lobby. And if you want to begin that spiritual journey today, you want to see who God really is and get to know him, not just, not just be informed about him, get to know him. You want to start that journey today. All I want you to do is just look right at me, and I'll acknowledge you, and then you can just bow your head again. And I'm going to go section by section until I get over here by the windows, but I just... We'll start right over by the lobby. So anyone in that section by the lobby, you want to start that spiritual journey today, just look right at me. I see that person. Okay. Next section over. Anyone wants to begin your journey today, just look right at me. I see that person. Just keep looking right at me until I acknowledge you. Just keep looking right at me. Just keep looking right at me. I see that person. Thank you. Okay. That person. Thank you. That person. That person, thank you. That person, thank you. I'm in the center section now. Just look right at me. If you're starting that journey today, thank you. I see that person, thank you. Just keep looking right at me until I acknowledge you. Just keep looking. I see that person, thank you. Anyone else? All right, next section over. If you're beginning that journey today, just look right at me. Okay, I see that person. Just keep looking until I acknowledge you. I see that person, thank you, and that person, thank you. Just keep looking right at me, okay? I see that person, and that person, thank you. Last section over, just look right at me if you're starting that journey today. I see that person, thank you. I see that person, thank you. Heavenly Father, um, we're not too humble or too embarrassed to admit, or too proud or too embarrassed to admit that we're not perfect. And as hard as we try, we don't seem to be able to become perfect. So today we choose to offer an incredible gift that you have made available to us. You chose to pay the price for all of our sins. You took on us everything that would have happened as a result of our sins in our lives and you took it on yourself and you gave us everything that would have happened in your life if you hadn't gone through that torture and pain. And you give us life eternal. We're so grateful for that today. And we receive it with joy. Would you help us now gain a clearer picture of who you really are? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand this morning.